Hello and welcome to this Medic Mind tutorial where today we're going to be focusing again on section one of the BMAP and this time looking at tabular questions, that is questions that involve tables or analyzing information in front of you. My name's George, let's begin. So there are two lesson objectives of today. The first is to get you answering some of these tabular questions. The second is to help highlight common traps and timing tips that can really help you when answering these questions. So here's our first question of today. Pause the video now and have a go. Fantastic, hopefully you've had a chance to have a go at that one. You can see that we're presented with a table as well as some accompanying information. And it's always important to read that accompanying information because it can inform how we go about reading that table. It might make us quicker. So from reading the information, we see that there are three friends and we have information about their BMI, their weight and their height, but never as a complete trio for any of the three friends. We're then told that we're meant to ask Anu's BMI. Now we know their combined weight, but we don't know the weight of the other two friends, but we have all the information that we need given that we have the table. So a good starting point would be to work out the weight of those two friends, subtract it from the 209 kilograms to find Anu's weight, and then read his BMI off the table. So let's do that. So the first friend, Mac, has a height of 155. We can find that on the table over here. Reading across, we're looking for a BMI of 27, which lies here. And if we see the cross section, actually it equals a value of 65 kilograms in weight for that height. So let's write that down for Mac. Moving on to Kalar, we do the exact same thing. So in this case, Kalar has a BMI of 23 and a height of 175. So we have the height down here. We can read across until we get to a BMI of 23. And we actually see that it cross sections on 70 kilograms. So this is a 70 kilogram weight. So we can write that underneath for Kalar. Now together, those total 135 kilograms which means that Anu, in order to make it up to 209 kilograms, must weigh 74 kilograms. So we can weigh that together and write down Anu's weight right underneath. So he has a weight of 74. We know that Anu's height is 160 centimeters, so we can now read it off the table. We go from 160 centimeters over here, reading across until we get to a weight of 74. We can then go up to find the BMI and we find that it's 29. So the answer here was A and that's 29 for his BMI. So you saw with this particular question there was the table but preceding that was a lot of information, three or four lines long. In this case, it's important to read that information at the start because it can frame how you read the text and the table. It also carries a lot of useful information and it helps to familiarize yourself with the situation that's going on. So rather than jumping straight into the question, it's good to familiarize yourself with the information, the table, and see how it all fits together first. Moving on to the next question then. Pause the video now and have a go at this one. So with this question, we're given again some information before the table. And that's really important because in this case, it tells us that there's a probability of one in 10 that a red team player selected at random is a junior level player. Now, what does that mean in terms of the table? It means that we're looking at this column right here, the red column, as our entirety of the population. And we're looking at this particular cell down here, the junior level players. So whatever that probability is, junior level players divided by the total down here should equal one over 10. Now with these questions where there's blanks in the table, it can be good just to fill in the blanks as you sort of read the table. In this case, we've got 100 over here, it's the total, and we've got 60 blue players. That means there must be 40 red players. So we can type that in right here. Now given that that's the total, and we know that the probability of junior level players over here is one in 10, that means there must be four junior level players in order so that we get four divided by 40, that's the same as one tenth. So we can write that in here. Now we're led on to the next step. We see that there's a total of 25 altogether, 
we know that there are four red team players at junior level, so therefore there must be 21 blue team players at junior level. And we can fill that in there. And that answers our question, so the answer here is E. Now if that wasn't the end of the question, you can see how you can fill in the other blanks, depending on the information that we're given. So it's always good to start piecing together that information as soon as you can when you see a table with missing information. So here the answer was E. So a really good tip that we have for tabular questions is to use the L technique. So read the table in an L shape. That means scanning down the first column first. Usually those are categories. In, in the last example, we saw junior level players, etc. Then reading along each row will then tell you the attributes associated with that category. In that way, the information is read in a way that seems to make intuitive sense and in a way that you would tell someone else that information. So it's easier to soak up during the exam. So let's move on to question three. Pause the video now and have a go at this one. Okay, let's go through this together. So using that L-shaped technique, you can see that actually the first column is days of the week, right down here. We can pick any particular row we care about. So let's take Tuesday and then read across in an L-shape. In this way, we read it off intuitively because we see at Tuesday, 3 p.m., there was 22% body fat composition, 44 muscle mass, as well as a 66 calorie count. That's just an example to show you how that L technique works. Now with this one, it's simply about scanning the data. There's nothing too complicated with the maths. It's simply absorbing the information in front of you and spitting out an answer. In this case, we're looking at the greatest discrepancy between body fat composition and muscle mass. Now with these questions, I like to read it as I go. So you can see here 22 and 44, that's a discrepancy of 22. Discrepancy just means difference. Now reading on, I like to replace it with the best alternative. So if I find one that's got a higher discrepancy, I sort of replace my top favorite with that entry. To show you how that works, we've got 2244. That's currently my top entry. The next one I read is 2246. Now clearly the discrepancy has gone up because that 46 is higher, whereas the 22 stays the same. So actually this one now is my best option. So I store that in my head. Moving on, 2343, that's not as good, we forget about it. Moving on, 2341, again, not as good, we forget about it. 2247, now this starts to look like it's challenging the best one in our head, which was 2246. And indeed, it does have a higher discrepancy, so we select that now as our favorite option. So 2247 is our preferred candidate. Repeating that process as we go down, we actually come across 2349 as the highest discrepancy. As you read the table, if it's just random entries, then you'll come across a pattern. The longer you read through the table, the more challenging it is to replace your top favorite. That's because you've already appreciated much of the variability in the data. So actually it makes sense that you come across the top entry here and all of these entries don't seem to challenge it. So altogether, this entry here is the highest discrepancy. We're then asked to, told to tell us what is the calorie count on that particular entry? In this case, it's 67. So we can select that as our answer, and the correct answer here is D. So sometimes these tables can come with the little caveats and nuggets of information underneath. And if you don't read them, that's a common trap. So a good tip is always to check underneath the table just to make sure there's nothing that you've missed out on and that you fully understand all the information that's present. Okay, moving on to our next example. Pause the video now and have a go. Let's go through this together then. So in this case, the information that we're given is really important. It sets out the ground rules as to how this system works. We're told that no professor can work more than three consecutive days. We're told that they have three shifts in a week, and we're told that each lecture has two lecturers present. So we can work it through. We're given the information initially for Professor Anderson in completion. That's all of his shifts because he has one, two, and three. 
We're given some information about Professor D in that he doesn't work on Mondays, and that's all we have, so we have to go from there. Now, given that we have this information about Professor Dean, it makes sense to start with Monday. We see that actually, because Professor Dean doesn't work on Monday, that means Professor Delves must be working. Moving on, we can see a little cross here. Professor Anderson doesn't work on any of these days. That means that in order to cover the shift, the other two professors must be working on those days. You can see just by doing that, that we've completed the information for Professor Delves. So that's fine. All we have to deal now with is Professor Dean, and he's got one shift remaining. Remember that you can't have three consecutive shifts, so we can't put him in for Thursday. That means that he must be working on Tuesday, which makes sense because then that would allow two lecturers to cover that day, Professor Anderson and Professor Dean. So to cover the question again, which day does both Professor Anderson and Professor Dean work? Well, that's Tuesday, so the correct answer here is B. So if you've not already spotted a trend, a lot of the time information can be hidden outside the table, whether that's in the premise before, whether that's underneath the table, and therefore it's really important to check that information. In the previous example, you could see most of the ground rules were set out in that initial piece of information. So read that carefully and make sure you, do, you don't miss a premise. Okay, moving on to our final question of today. Pause the video now and have a go. So let's go through this one together. So within the premise here, we're told the basic rules. You get three points for a win, one point for a draw, and zero points for a loss. And this is a theme that crops up time and time again with BMAT, so it's worth familiarising yourself with these kind of questions where teams receive points depending on their win, draw, or lost. Now in this case, teams play each other once. In other words, each team will play three games, one against each of the remaining teams. We can see that the Saracens, or Sarakens, have nine points. That means they must have won against every other team because they must have won three and got three points for each, 3 times 3 gives us 9. So the Sarakens must have won all three games. That means that each of the remaining teams must have at least one loss. Now if we look at the other extreme, the Ospreys, the Ospreys earned 0 points. That means they must have lost all their games. So in other words, the Harlequins and the Bulls must have both won against the Ospreys. That means that the Harlequin and Bulls so far would have 3 points. Now, of course, in reality, they have four points. That means that both are missing one potential point. We know that they lost against the Saracens, and we know that they won against the Ospreys. The only game they haven't played is against each other. Now, given that they both received one point for that game, we're told that they must have drawn that game. So what did the Harlequin do against the Bulls? Well, they must have drawn. So the answer here is B. Okay, and that kind of sums up the lesson. So there are a few take-home points. The first one was that we've practiced some of these tabular questions, and hopefully you feel a bit more confident about approaching these in the exam. Second, we ran through some common traps as well as some timing tips to help you answer these questions more quickly. Now, those include reading the table in an L shape to help you soak up the information in the table more quickly, and second, reading the premise as well as any information below the table to help you familiarise yourself with the ground rules as to how that table has been constructed. And that's our lesson complete. 